Okay, so before I forget, I have just uploaded last night the homework for next week. And there are two questions that I don't know if I talked about, so I want to make sure you got those questions right. So remember that visible light have a smaller wavelength than infrared, and infrared have smaller wavelength than radio wave. So when you have a nebula like this one, so this one is Orion Nebula, so it's a cloud of, of dust, so it's made of dust and gas, and in the background you have light and you have stars, but the visible light, okay, so if you want to look at the stars behind the, the cloud, okay, so here it's very hard to see the stars behind those clouds, in the visible in the visible light it's very hard to see because the visible light have such a small wavelength that the wavelength of visible light will be smaller than dust so it means when light coming from the stars which are in the background okay hidden by the cloud so the light from the stars they move to it's it's moving Toward us, it will be stopped by the dust because the wavelength of visible light is smaller than dust. However, if you look in the infrared, so the infrared light coming from the star, because infrared has a large wavelength, it will just bend around the dust, like the dust is not even there. So remember, this is called diffraction. So if the wavelength is smaller than the dust, the dust will stop it. So that's why in the visible light, we cannot see the stars in the background. But if we use infrared vision, if we use an infrared telescope or sensor, then we can see what's going on in the background because infrared have such a large wavelength that it will bend over the dust. Okay, so there was one question like that. And there was another question in the assignment. Remember that Einstein, he got the Nobel Prize, not for special relativity, not for general relativity, but for the photoelectric effect. Okay, so he is the one who came up with the idea that light can behave like a particle, okay, like a particle wave. And these particles, they can kick out electrons from silicon for example, producing electricity, okay? So that's how solar panels. So if I ask you, so there was those two questions for the assignment, yes. If we use like sunscreen, well, what it does is that it bounces the wave from... It, it absorbs the UV, UV wavelength. It's a good question. So, you, so there, there are three types of UV, UVA, UVB, UVC. UVC does not reach us, so it would be very dangerous for us because it has such a small wavelength. And then you have another kind of UV, I'm not sure if it was UVB or UVA, that has such a small wavelength, it can go in your skin, okay? And then there it can kick out electrons from DNA, so it can mess up DNA. However, we have evolved to have a protection when you turn. For example, when you are tan, you know the UV cannot get through. And uh, UV light, of course, is very good for uh, vitamin D. So you need UV light for vitamin D. And um, and uh, screen, the, the, the sunscreen, you have to be careful. It doesn't have aluminum, right? Because it can be toxic too. So I don't know which one is the worst even. But, but, but let's go back to the physics. Yes, UV photon have such a small size that it would get inside your skin. Not full, like X-ray or gamma ray, but still penetrate inside the skin. Okay, oh, by the way, so we have a test the 16th. I think, I think that will be good. Uh, 16, October 16, it's a, it's a Monday. It will have the same format, so it will be in person, multiple choices, just 20 minutes uh, test. It's it's not uh, cumulative, so it will cover 
uh, light spectroscopy and whatever, like maybe solar system, if we cover that before then. Is that clear? So last time we talked about uh, spectroscopy a lot. And again, if you have if you have a star, a star without its atmosphere, okay, so which which doesn't happen, but just just the star here, when you collect the light, you can have that light go through a prism. The prism prism will split the light into its wavelength. It will even tell you how much of each wave wavelength, the intensity of each wavelength. So remember, if I ask you for the assignment, the, the green, uh, the sun peak in, in the green. And since we know exactly which green it's peaking in, we can find its temperature, which is about 10,000 Fahrenheit uh, on, on the outside. So a star not only has, of course, here, but it also has an atmosphere all around. So superimposed to that continuum, you're going to see these QR codes. And by looking at this QR code, then you can tell what is that atmosphere of the star or the outermost layer it's made of. Is that clear? So when you have a star, I think it was one of the first pictures here. Here you see you have the star there, this is a plasma, and then here you have the outermost layer. That, that layer will, will, absorb, will absorb some of the wavelength emitted by the fusion reaction that's happening in, in the core of the star. Okay, so that's how it works. It doesn't have to be a star. You could, you could have a nebula here that will absorb some of the wavelength. So this is a deficit in wavelength. Okay, now if we look in another direction, we're going to see those wavelengths being burnt out. So this is called an absorption line, uh, absorption lines, and these are called emission lines. Okay, so we talk about that. I, ju I just found the, the website I was looking for. So each element of the periodic table has its own QR code, right? So that would be for hydrogen. So when you are looking at this, this is only in the visible. You also have lines in the UV and lines in the infrared, but here you only see the visible part of the spectrum. So you have helium, that will be the QR code. So if you have helium and hydrogen in a cloud or outside um, in the atmosphere of a, of a star, you're going to see both, both here both QR codes mixed together. Is that clear? So each element here has its own QR code. So that will be for carbon. Here you have uh, calcium here. Okay, and these are the noble gas, so xenon. Let's look at xenon. Have those lines. No. Well, now it's only show, showing me the, um, the absorption line, that's fine. Okay, so here you have those lines here. Okay, so that's how it works. So you can classify the stars, and that was done in the late 19th century by, um, and we will talk about that. But you can classify the stars into classes, and we call that the spectral classes. So according to their QR code, right? According to these uh, lines superimposed to the continuum. So you have O, B, A, F, G, K, F. Remember, oh boy, a uh, fine guy or girl, kiss me lovingly. You have another class here that doesn't show L. And each one you see has, so the O star will be the hot star, and as you go down, the star will get cooler. So you have the temperature here. So another question for the assignment, a red star is cooler than the blue star. So these are the hottest star, and these are the coolest star. 
And as we're going to see, if a star is cool, it means it's burning its fuel very slowly. So it has a slow metabolism. Because it has a very slow metabolism, it's going to live forever because there is no gas station in space to uh, take to, to increase the fuel level, okay? Once you run out of fuel, when a star is running out of fuel, there is nothing to re replenish, right? To, to uh, increase the fuel again. So low, low temperature star will last for a very, very long time and they will be red. Hot star have a very high metabolism, so they burn their fuel very quickly and they're gonna last forever, okay? So what you see when you look, look at the spectra of stars, you see a continuum of color like the rainbow and superimposed to it, you see those black lines. And those black lines are just deficit in wavelength. Because so you can, this one can be very thin, so you, you are missing a little bit of that. This one would be, a, you are missing more wavelength in, into that color. So that's how it works. So, so in the real life, that it looks like this, okay? And then you have a graduate students who have to go over thousands of those spectra, analyzing them, running computer code, trying to understand what's going on. So here, it doesn't have to be from a star, it could be also from a galaxy. So here you have, I think this one is from a star. So you see all those deficits here. Yeah, absorption lines. Of course, you have to be a trained spectroscopist to uncode, to, to decode, okay? It's like, a, it's like a computer code, right? You really have to be good at it to understand what, what are the uh, chemicals, uh, the, the, the elements here yeah, that you have there. You can just look at those bars and if you are good, if you are trained, then you can tell what is the chemical composition of the object you are looking at, or the cloud that you are looking at, or the star you are looking at. The thickness of the line will also tell you the density of a star. And if the lines move, if it's moving to the red, that means the object is moving away from us. If the lines are moving toward us, uh, to the blue, it means it's blue shifted, so it's moving toward us. Okay, so this is the same thing, this is the same thing again. And we talk about the physics behind it. It's just that in a atom, so here you have the nuclei and then you have electrons. Each electron has a specific level of energy. So an electron, when it's exposed to light, so it's exposed to all kinds of photon, each photon has its specific energy and by the way there's a question also for next week you know if you increase the frequency you increase the energy and you lower the wavelength so red photon have lower energy than blue photon red photon have a, a low frequency blue photon have high frequency so when an electron absorb one of those photon if that photon has the right energy, it can get high, make it to a higher level of energy, right? So when you are looking in this direction, you are missing some of the photon. That will explain the lines here, okay? Because you are mis missing the red photon, you are missing a blue photon, and you are missing a purple photon. So here, at those positions here, you're going to have some black lines. If you look in the other direction, so you're going to see those photons here, and that will be an emission line. Is that clear? Just a little bit of physics here, not much. So I'm sure if you took a chemistry class, for example, uh, back then, you see that uh, these here are the levels of energy for hydrogen. So you see an electron can decide to go from level 3 to level 2. So it's going to burn out a red photon. Or it can take that red photon to go high 
before it's burping out again. Okay, so it's absorbing that photon. You're going to see a black line. It can go from level four to number two. So it needs a green photon to do that. Exactly one specific wavelength of green. Okay, so that's why you see a black line. So that's how it works. Is that clear? We are only talking about visible light, but you also have light in the uh, infrared. You also have lines into it in the infrared or even in the UV. With the UV, you can go from level one to higher up. For infrared, you don't go uh, very far. Okay? You don't have enough energy. They don't have enough energy. So here, that would be um, Franhofer, I think was a high school uh, teacher. And he's the one who discovered those lines um, from the cell. Okay, so that's the solar spectrum. And that's how, and that's another question from the Simon. That's how they discover helium, because they found helium uh, from those lines unknown till then, a special QR code which is um, corresponding with helium. Okay, so they call helium after helios. Okay, we talk about that. So here, that's a nebula. And why is it so bright in colors? That's because of the emission lights. So in the background, you have stars that you cannot see here. The, the lines, the, the light made of photons will be absorbed. Some of the photons will be absorbed by the gas and the photon will be burned out again. So that's why you see those beautiful colors. Okay, so that's how it works. Here you have the Orion Nebula. I talked about that at the beginning of the class. Uh, beautiful here display of colors. Again, here you have a star at the center that will be a white dwarf. And you see the light from the white dwarf. It's going to interact with the cloud here of gas and dust. Some of the wavelength will be absorbed and burp out again. So you have a lot of red photons being burped out here. You have green photons being burped out in another direction. So same thing here and same thing there. Uh, this one I think is the Eskimo nebula. This looks like an Eskimo um, with some imagination. So what's a planetary nebula? That will be the, 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 the what, that's going to be what will happen to our sun. At the end of its life, it's going to be burping out, but very gently. It's like a cosmic burp. Okay? Burping out the outmost layer, exposing here uh, the core. And that core is a white dwarf. Okay? So the white dwarf will be the remnant of our sun in the future, okay? In five billion years from now, the sun will burp out all its layer and what will be left behind is called the white dwarf. The white dwarf is already dead because it ran out of fuel and there is no more, I mean, there is no gas station to put fuel again. So it's, it's not alive, it does not burn fuel, but it's still very hot. So it will take a long time to cool down and to become a black dwarf. So in the meantime, it's uh, shining here and, and all the light is absorbed by the cloud around. Is that clear? So this is called the Ant Nebula. That's also physics because you see when it's, it was burping out its outmost layer, it did it in two opposite directions. Okay, so it's like conservation of momentum. Here, another example. Any questions so far? So again, I just posted the homework for uh, next week. And, um, and what else? The, the test in, is October 16th. So we are done with spectroscopy. And we're going to talk briefly about the solar system. Not too much in details because there is another class about that, about the solar system, which is also an introductive class. 
solar system, uh, we already know that all the planets, you know, they orbit the sun counterclockwise, including Pluto. Okay, and they are all part of what we call the ec um, ecliptic plane. Okay, so it's like the solar system is kind of flat and it's part of the Milky Way. So here you see the ecliptic plane here. That will be with Pluto orbit. So all around here you have a Kuiper belt, which is also part of the solar system. And really far away you have the Earth cloud. Okay, all that junks orbiting the sun, and it's also part of the solar system. Meaning that it's under the influence of gravity. Okay, so it's the sun pulling on all those junks here to make sure the junk don't fly away and break free. Okay, so we have seen that picture many times. Um, you, you see that Pluto comes closer to the sun than Neptune itself. So I still say it's very unfair that it was demoted. So they all go counterclockwise, but as far as the rotation goes, so most planets rotate about their axis counterclockwise, except for Venus. So Venus is clockwise, and also we have Uranus, which is clockwise, but it's weird, right? It's rolling on its side like a, like a barrel. Okay, so the weirdos are Venus and Uranus. Otherwise, all the other planets, they go clockwise. So I know if I have a picture, a solar system here. So you see uh, the Earth also is tilted. You have Uranus here. So this, this, actually this picture is more for the, uh, no, this picture is not good. It's, it's just for the magnetic field. Okay, I will look for another picture here. Okay, so about the formation of the solar system, that's a theory. No, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a theory in, in, the, in the sense that we think that's what happened, but it's not 100% sure, because what we think happened when you have um, a new solar system, now we have, we have found new exoplanets, and it doesn't really fit the, the, the theory that we had. But we have a gross idea of what happened. So what's, uh, what's happening here in a nebula, like you have Orion Nebula, you can have like a cloud of gas and dust. And if you have enough gravity, everything starts to collapse, right? To be brought together because gravity is kind of a glue. But if you had a spin to start with, okay? So if it was starting to rotate, then it cannot be collapsing in this direction. Why? Because what we call the centrifugal force, right? So if you have a carousel or a merry-go-round, if you are sitting in here, okay, from your point of view, in that frame of reference, you're gonna experience the centrifugal force. Does that make sense? As long as it's rotating about the axis, you feel a force pushing you up so that's called a centrifugal force. And uh, for example, this is uh, Michelle Kwan. I think she is one of the most uh, decorated uh, athletes. I think she's retired now. But you see that the skirt here, she's, she's spinning very, very fast. The spur, the, the skirt here is, is um, flung out, okay, flinging out. That's because of the centrifugal force. Uh, centrifugal force. So here, same thing here. It start to rotate here, but it cannot collapse in this direction because it's being in in equilibrium between gravity pushing in and the centrifugal force pushing out. 
However, in this direction, you do not have a spin like this. You only have the spin along the horizontal, if we say that's the horizontal. So it's going to be flattened out because of gravity. So in this direction, there is nothing to balance out gravity, so it's going to be flattened out. In this direction, you have the centrifugal force. So at the end, you're going to have some kind of disk. Therefore, we have the ecliptic plane with all the planets here, and here we have the sun. As, as there is a balance between gravity and, and the centrifugal force, you see that at the center, okay, at the center, uh, it's going to spin faster because that's called the conservation of spin. So if you have Michelle Kwan, Okay, making a spin on ice. If she brings the arm in, what's going to happen to her? Very good, she's going to spin faster, right? So here, the molecules and the gas and everything else, the helium and the hydrogen spin really, really fast, fast enough that they're going to collide with each other. They're going to be squeezed together. And if there is enough temperature, enough pressure, then you can start fusion. When you start fusion, you have a protostar, a baby star. That star will wipe out all the debris out with the solar wind. So solar wind, you see the, the um, let's see if I have a picture here. See, the, the sun is always burping particles here, right? Electrons and protons, alpha particles. So it's like a wind blowing out of the sun. So that wind was very strong at the beginning. So it's uh, clean, it's like cleaning everything else, but the planet that were already formed here, right? So that's what, so that's, that's how we think it happened. So the theory was that, I don't know why the image, Okay. The theory was that at the very close, close to the sun, close to the sun, it was so hot that hydrogen, you know, flew away because hydrogen and helium, it's a gas. Okay. So the planets here around the sun, the, the, the terrestrial planets like the Earth, could not hold on hydrogen and helium because hydrogen and helium is a gas but it has a very small mass so it was all excited because the temperature so it moves it moved away from the sun so that will explain why the other planets like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus have mostly hydrogen and helium except it does not fit with what we are seeing today that we see big Jupiter very close to their sun Okay, so we don't know exactly why. Maybe because the big Jupiter that we see in other solar systems, in other system, uh, maybe maybe they were farther away and then they move close to the to their star. We don't really know. So anyway, it happened four point five billion years ago. So let's see if I have a. Uh, I have two videos. I know one is better than the other one. So I know video formation solar system. Do you see something from here? This one? I have two. Well, let's try this one. Our solar system, the place we call home, lies about 26,000 galaxies, the Milky Way, mm -hmm. or around oh, two-thirds two of the way up. Way up. The story of how the these huge, huge planets, planets came to be orbiting an average, average yellow, yellow star, star is six, six billion years, years long. long. And since That's we don't have that much time now, I'll speak it up about it. It starts, starts with a bang. Long ago, an ancient star exploded, littering space with swirling clouds of the materials it had made while it lived, and the heavier metals it created as it died. 
We know this because we can see similar fields of dust out in space today. They are called nebula, and they are very beautiful. Every nebula is different, and in our case, the clouds contain nitrogen and oxygen and iron and silica and all the other stuff needed to build the world like ours. Then the tireless force of gravity started to pull it all back together, and the heavy engineering that produces planets began. Vast spirals of dust began to form, and at the center of one of these, a rocky planet called Earth started to take shape. Built of stardust and assembled by gravity. Fast forward 100 million years, and it had grown into a giant ball, sweeping up millions of tons of celestial debris. This is where the Earth came from, and therefore how you and I began. Our planet would have remained a large, sterile ball of rock and metals and minerals forever, were it not for one more event, one more expression of the forces of nature. 93 million miles away, at the heart of the giant nebula, the pressure and temperature of a ball of hydrogen gas had become so great that the atoms were beginning to fuse. A new star. Our sun was coming to life. As the sun ignited, it gave off a huge blast of solar wind, a radioactive gust of energy. This blew all the remaining dust and gas that was left over from the nebula out to the edge of the solar system which is why everything is nice and orderly today. In the outer reaches of the solar system, we have the huge gas planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Further in are the denser, rockier planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, and of course, the Earth. Lucky for us, the sun is 865,000 miles in diameter, or just the right size to burn consistently for a very long time. 18 billion years. Long enough to allow the next development to take place. Life. Okay, so you see at the beginning what he said? Our solar We feel that before the sun, there was a supernova, so it's a massive star that died in a huge explosion. Inside that explosion, it's so energetic that you have uranium, iron, all the heavy metal made. And from that left over, there was the sun and the solar system that built up. So we are the dust of stars. So all the iron that run into your blood was cooked into that supernova that came just before our sun. So everything is actually recycled, okay? Uh, I have another one, so I don't know if you can see a video of the formation of the solar system. Do you see that? Formation in six minutes, okay? Do you have six minutes? Okay. This is the story of our Earth's formation four and a half billion years ago, the end of a little asteroid called Bennu, who's also survived until now. We have the team at NASA to thank for bringing us this video. The Milky Way, home to billions of stars, or billions of worlds, including our own. In this vast expanse, how did our sun, the Earth, and the planets come to be? In recent decades, our understanding of the solar system's evolution has greatly improved, but deep questions remain. To answer those questions, astronomers are preparing to visit someplace very small, asteroid Bennu. 
a lump of rock and organic material, the early building blocks of the solar system, of Earth, of us. Bennu is a time capsule, and its journey takes us way, way back, four and a half billion years. The raw ingredients of Bennu and our solar system originated in a stellar nursery, a vast cloud of hydrogen, helium, and dust. Our own sun doesn't yet exist. Nearby are hot stars like this one, quickly burning up its fuel and destroying itself in a colossal explosion called a supernova. The explosion destabilizes our cloud, causing it to collapse. In the geologic blink of an eye, a hundred thousand years, gravity and angular momentum flatten the cloud into a swirling disk. In the center, where molecules crash together tightest, a protostar revs up to incredible pressures and temperatures. Deep within the disk, clumps of dust not much larger than a grain of wheat are flash heated into droplets of molten rock called chondrules. The source of this heat remains a mystery. Chondrules are destined to become the building blocks of the solar system. Coaxed by gravity and turbulence, the chondrules clump. They grow into the first asteroids, into mountains, into planets. The asteroids are rubble piles of rock, metal, ice, and organics. This large asteroid is the parent body of Bennu, a protoplanet whose size we can only guess. Closer to the protostar, a planet begins to form. And then, dawn in the solar system. The protostar undergoes fusion and ignites, revealing our sun. But the solar system is far from finished. Jupiter most likely forms near its outer edge, but just 500 million years after the sun ignites, some believe that it slowly moves inward. Its massive gravity ripples the asteroid belt, disrupting countless asteroids and comets, bringing them toward the sun. They rain down on the inner planets, hammering and remelting large portions of the crust. Did these impacts also deliver organics and water, key ingredients for life? Back in the asteroid belt, Bennu's parent body is lucky. It survives this period of heavy bombardment. The solar system cools and calms. Jupiter and its many moons assume the orbits that we see today. Billions of years of quiet fall, more or less. Then a billion years ago, one theory suggests a collision shatters the protoplanet. Some of the debris loosely coalesces into a new, smaller body, Bennu. But Bennu will not stay in place. Dull, non-reflective, it slowly migrates toward the sun. Solar heating turns its warm side into a low-intensity thruster. Through millions of years, Bennu's orbit gradually tightens until it interacts with Saturn's gravity, altering its trajectory and hurling it into the inner solar system. Close encounters with Earth and Venus follow. Their gravitational tugs may have repeatedly stretched and reformed Bennu, turning it inside out and pulling off this material. As a result, it has no satellites of its own until now. Today, NASA is sending a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx to explore Bennu and retrieve a sample. Why? Bennu has survived its long journey and settled into a near-Earth orbit, bringing its secrets within our reach. Now it is ready to teach us more about the solar system's history, its formation, its evolution, and our own place among the stars. So that's from NASA. So it's a very, it's a very good video. Any question? Are you still here? No one fell asleep. It's good. Okay. So here, Orion. That's the Orion Nebula here. So here, you cannot see what's behind Orion Nebula or any nebula because of the reason I have explained before. However, if you look in the infrared, then you can peek through. Okay. Infrared, you can peek through the dust because infrared have such a small a large wavelength that it will burn around the dust. Okay, 
So again, that will be the same picture seen in the visible. So you cannot see anything in the background because light will be stopped by the dust. But if you look in the infrared, large wavelength band around, make it to us or to the telescope. Okay. Okay, so we talk about that. That will be the the planets, the sun, Kuiper belt, and the core cloud here. Sometimes you have a comet visiting us from the oral cloud and coming back, or maybe it doesn't come back. If it comes from the oral cloud, it can take a it can take a thousand years, okay, to reach us or to make an orbit. If it comes from the Kuiper belt, like Halley comet, it will take about hundred years. So heady comet is 76 years. In between here, between Mars and Jupiter, you have the asteroid belt. And it was supposed to be a planet, maybe smaller than the moon. However, because you have a big bully here, it has such a big mass, so it's tugging on everything it can. And so because of the tugging, the, those little debris here, these little asteroids could not go together, coalesce together to form a planet. So then uh, about, um, so you have two kinds of planets. You all know that, right? Terrestrial planet, mostly uh, solid. It, it's, it's not mostly, it's all solid here. And density is larger than one. Earth has the largest density because it has a large iron core. And then you have the other giant planets, mostly made of gas, hydrogen, mostly. So that's how we think that the planets were formed. Little debris here, they, they, they come together because of gravity and because it was very hot, it's melting down, so iron, maybe sink here in, in the core at the center and then the lighter elements or compounds like silicon make make the crust for example of the earth right so you see all the planets here and if you look at the density you see that earth has the largest density of all the terrestrial planets, okay? So very high density for Earth here, okay? So it's above one. Can you tell me which planet has a density smaller than one? Saturn, very good. So it means if you had an ocean large enough, Saturn will float, right? And maybe you will see the, the ring like a brilliant around Saturn, but you see that the density is smaller than one, so that means it will float if you have it in the ocean of water. And here we have Aries here that was that that did cause the demotion of Pluto and here you have Pluto. So if you're interested you can look at that table there. So about Earth you all know here so at the center, you have a core. So you have a molten core and then a solid core, mostly made of iron. So because you have a molten core here, you have like ions, okay? Mostly ions like iron, iron, ions moving, okay? And because it's moving each time you have charged particles moving, you create a magnetic field. So that will be the source for the magnetic field of the Earth. So we are very lucky to have a magnetic field because the magnetic field of the Earth protects us against the solar wind. So protect us from all the electrons coming from the sun, from the protons, from the alpha particles. That would be very bad if it reaches us. So we have this magnetic field here to protect us. Okay, so what else here? You have the little sphere. It's like a crust here, and it's broken into plates. Those plates, 
they move relative to each other. They can slide past each other, like it's happening in California. You have a St. Andreas fault. And it, so it's hooked up. So the plates are hooked together. And when it let go, boom, you have an earthquake. Or you can have one plate going underneath another one. So you have all the volcanoes, you know, around the Pacific, the ring of fire. So it's it's very dynamic, okay? It's very dynamic, so it's uh, because it has some some heat coming from inside, from actually um, radioactive elements here. So you have a lot of uranium there, so decay of radioactive element that will produce a lot of heat. Because of the heat, it moves. Okay, so you have earthquakes. So um, very recently, I don't know if it was last year. You, you have earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, very damaging earthquake. Recently, it was in Syria. That's because, because of the plates, okay? Moving relative to each other. So again, they hook up with each other and building energy, building potential energy, and then it goes, and then you have an earthquake. So it happens a lot in this uh, region. So you have a magnetic field, okay? And let me show you an app. What is that? Give me a headache. So what is this? You know, you all know what it is, right? It's a magnet, very good. So you have the south and the north. And here it's a compass. The compass is also made of a magnet. And of course, the north of the compass here will be attracted to the south of the magnet. And if you move around here, you see that will be the south. Of, of the compass attracted to the North Pole. So this is the North Pole and the South Pole, right? Okay, so now if I have the planet Earth, you see I have my compass here, and this is the North Pole of the compass, and it's attracted by the North, the geographic North. So what does that mean? We all know that the North side of your compass will show you the north that we know but what people do not know is that if this is the north pole of your compass that means here you have the south pole so the geographic north of earth is actually its magnetic south so everything happens like the Earth is behaving like a huge bar magnet. The magnetic south is at the geographic north, and the magnetic north is, is at the geographic uh, south. Huh? Isn't that interesting? So it's producing a magnetic field all around us that protects us. It's a shield against all the nasty thing coming from space, not only from the sun, but all those cosmic particles that can harm us. So um, that's why, let me, if I have um, here, oh, it's 49, oh, too bad. I had a great simulation to show.